Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out to One Million Cups. Um, One Million Cups is a nonprofit organization, or it's actually run by a nonprofit organization called the Kaufman Foundation. It was started five years ago in Kansas City and has since spread to 120 different United States cities. And Dallas is proud to be one of the top 10 chapters, thanks to the awesome community of people like yourselves that come out. And do we have any new members in the audience today? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much for coming out. So the format is that we have two startups every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. And actually every One Million Cups meets every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. So there's a hundred other cities doing this exact same thing right now. And we give each presenter six minutes. And at six minutes, everyone starts clapping. So we're not trying to be rude to the presenters. It's just a way to be fair to everyone. So if you hear clapping, go ahead and clap along with us. And um, today we're going to hear from two really cool startups. Uh, the first one is a healthcare company, and the other one is um, involved with beauty and style and fashion. So um, thank you so much for coming out. If you could give our first presenter a big round of applause and stand up for your applause. Yeah. My name is Joshua Benowitz. I'm co-founder and CEO of Articulate Labs. Our work is focused on taking critical elements of physical therapy out of the clinic and into everyday activity through wearable medical technology that augments movement. Uh, our story and this invention, uh, like so many others, uh, starts with uh, personal need and frustration. Uh, Herbie Kern, the other co-founder of this company, is an amputee as a result of a motorcycle accident. Uh, one of the indirect outcomes of that accident was that he wore down the cartilage in the knee of his fully intact leg. The situ that situation was such that if he doesn't handle that particular knee pain that was preventing him from using his fully intact leg, he was not going to be able to walk and thus was going to have a lot more difficulty working and living, living his life. He had the opportunity to go through the wide variety of conservative options that are available for people in that situation, a condition called knee osteoarthritis. He found uh, was unsatisfactory. He found the braces to be bulky and uncomfortable and ineffective, especially when he had to take them off. He found the uh, injections to, be, to have uh, middling efficacy. Sometimes it, sometimes it would help, sometimes it wouldn't. The medications came with significant side effects that either uh, affected his uh, gastrointestinal system, inducing pain or uh, clouded his thought, made it, made it hard for him to be an engineer. What was the most effective for him was physical therapy. But he, wasn't, he did not have the time or the reimbursement coverage necessary to get all the physical therapy he needed. And it turns out, uh, we thought this was, initially we thought this was just something that was specific to amputees, but this is actually something that's very common. Knee osteoarthritis affects 14 million in the United States. It's driving over 700,000 knee replacements per year, a number that's estimated to grow to 2 million per year by 2030. Uh, that's also not including the people who have a uh, need for rehabilitation related to ACL or PCL reconstruction, uh, men uh, meniscectomy, or other or, uh, rehab rehabilitating from fractures. In all of these cases, it's critical that the quadriceps muscle, the thigh muscle, is rehabilitated because it's responsible in large part for shock absorption and weight distribution across the knee. We see repeatedly in research that the better the shape of the quadricep, the better the shape of the knee, and the better the patient will be able to handle that knee as they're either waiting for uh, surgical intervention or as they're just trying to operate in everyday life. We look to address that need with a device that we've called knee stim. This device in at root is a neuromuscular electrical stimulation device, which means it is pulsing current through a muscle in order to prompt contraction. This is a known modality, well-researched modality for, uh, for addressing muscles, uh, muscle atrophy and muscle inhibition. What we've done, though, is we've added motion tracking hardware and machine learning in order to take that stimulation and make it mobile, to make it adapt with gait, to make it line up with muscle loading events, in order to uh, 
take everyday activity, whether it's walking up and down stairs, getting in and out of your car, uh, walking around the grocery store buying food, taking every single action, every single step, and augmenting it in order to turn it into a light rehabilitation activity. The reason this is valuable is, again, NMES is a, is a known modality, but as you see here, most of the implementations for muscle simulation are electrodes and wires and uh, leads going back to a box. And the fact is you can't walk like this. It's a challenge to be able to use this device the way you'd want to. Uh, otherwise, you, you have to use it uh, stationary, sitting down and just uh, doing leg lifts or, or very basic exercises as the device is operational. There's a few benefits that comes with our, our device's ability to be usable while mobile. <laughs> Obvious one is convenience, is being able to take a rehabilitation activity with you through your everyday life. Another benefit is that we see in research that, excuse me, we see in research that muscle stimulation concomitant with voluntary muscle activation are gonna give you better strength gains than just using the stimulation passively. By augmenting activity, we get that synergy that we do, you don't otherwise achieve while using the device passively. We've put in a lot of work to make this a reality. Uh, the, two high, the two milestones we want to highlight for this presentation are that we do have proof of concept data out of both UT Austin and Baylor University showing that this device is stimulating the right muscles at the right times and that it's leading to demonstrable change in gait and muscle activation. We also have uh, four patents issued and owned exclusively by Arctic Inlet Labs in the area of motion tracking muscle stimulation. The the claim oh, the claims that was quick. Uh, the claims are. <laughs> I, I I've been training for five minutes. I I thought I needed to stretch it out a little bit and I screwed up. So uh, the the claims are not specific to the it's the. This, this technology can be extensible to all joints and all musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, we are looking to raise money. This is not a public solicitation. Please don't kill the SEC. Uh, we are looking, though, to achieve uh, major milestones in the next year, which include design freeze, uh, applying for FDA clearance, getting earning that FDA clearance by quarter three of next year, and having this device prescribable by the end of next year. 15 seconds. Uh, we believe that this device will actually make sales, will be used uh, not just because of the unmet need that exists, but because of how well this device fits the profile of the patients who are out there seeking the most for this device. And so as we go into the q and I just want to remind everybody, um, as you ask your questions, please stand up, give us your name a little bit, and then ask your question. First question is, as a community, what can we do for you? So, yeah, I appreciate that because that was going to be part of the end. Um, <laughs> again, wildly miscalculated my time here. Uh, so the things that we could use the most right now are we want feedback from uh, physicians, from uh, orthopedic surgeons, physiatrists, rheumatologists, and physical therapists. Uh, we want to be able to get more clinical data on this device and be able to test in more places. Uh, through the Health Wildcatters program here in Dallas, we've had an opportunity to meet a lot of folks, but there's a lot more we can, a lot more people we can get feedback from. So that's that's a number one thing I could ask for. Any questions? That's to be determined. Um, honestly, we're focused solely right now on getting the knee device on the market ready. And at the point that we have 
stable revenue and that we've proven ourselves, then we have the opportunity to, to move on and, and hit other joints. Hi, my name is McKenzie. Uh, great job. You did a great presentation. You. Have no fear. You have all this time to make up your last minute in all the Q&A, right? <laughs> um, what is your, my question is, what is your go-to market strategy with this? Initially, we're going to be a self-tape device. Um, we need to we need to start that way because we need to get the data necessary to make the argument to CMS and to private uh, private insurers that this device does what we say it does, and that it has uh, cost and time benefit to the uh, to the end user and to the provider. So the the initial three to six months is going to be spent focused on people who are willing to pay out of pocket for something that would help them through their everyday activity, people who are, uh, because of, of uh, work or family considerations, completely unable to get out and get the rehabilitation that they need. Uh, once we are able to prove that the codes that are, that are in existence are applicable to our device, then we expect to be able to uh, spread out to a broader market, uh, to the market that is uh, less likely to, to pay out of pocket. Uh, long, long term, we do want to earn our own reimbursement codes for this device, but we're going to start with the uh, existing device, uh, existing codes are out there for neuroscular electrical stimulation. Hi, my name is Rocky. I'm actually a rehab doctor, so cool. I've treated awesome. a, a bunch of knees. Um, so what's, what's the cost on your um, device? Because there are eSTEM devices out there, and my, I'm trying to figure out if this is a little bit more cost effective to maybe just use um, an easy, simple lead eSTEM device that you can have a uh, patient learn like a home exercise program or a protocol and be able to do those same exercises for conditioning and strengthening versus your device. What's the big cost difference? And then my second question is, you know, a lot of my therapists, we want to be able to figure out a way to get quantification of how much the patient did in terms of walking, ambulating stairs, how many reps, how much weight was on the leg. So is there a way to get feedback from this motion sensing to say, I can make a billable bill on the therapy that was done? Because that's gonna really help you, you know, disseminate this product a little bit more if it has some more application in a business model. All right, so I'm gonna, I'll, first that all makes sense. I'm, 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 the second question first, which is, we are able to pull data off that device. Um, that's something that we need to go and, and validate, specifically uh, against other goniometers. Uh, but we do see the op opportunity to get uh, feedback on uh, knee range, of, minimally knee range of motion, knee flexion, knee extension, as well as uh, just device compliance. That if we're tracking how much this uh, this device is flexing. How much, how much movement is being measured, we should be able to get a sense for how much this person is actually using the device. Uh, pricing, honestly, is something we're still trying to figure out. Uh, the, what we see in, in reimbursement for similar devices is around $750, uh, both for use of neuromuscular electrical stimula stimulation and for, the, uh, for a conductive garment. I don't know, though, right now, whether that's cost effective for the end user and whether that's cost effective for the physical therapist. That's part of why I need to go out and talk to more people and validate whether this price point is real or whether it's just something that's on a piece of paper out of CMS. Cool. Any other questions? You just went through an accelerator program. Tell us how you got into the accelerator. Tell us what benefits you got from this, the accelerator. Uh, tell us about your experience. Okay. Um, so the uh, the accelerator program is called Health Wildcatters. Um, it's uh, just a couple couple of, uh, rail stops down the road on uh, Pacific and Elm. The uh, it's twelve weeks uh, intensive focus on. A lot of it was on, on actually being able to pitch because I, I'm, I'm getting better at it, but I started off real rough. Um, but a lot of it is also being able, uh, being tapped into a bigger and deeper uh, medical, uh, medical network than I had been able to access previously in Austin, uh, which is where I'm currently based. Um, the uh, people there were, were fantastic. They were. Uh, 
you know, simultaneously supportive and critical. Um, they, they beat up the business plan, they beat up the pitch. Uh, they did that for 12 weeks, culminating in a, in a big event uh, over at the Majestic Theater where we got to uh, present in front of uh, upwards of 400 people or so. So that was, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have gone through the experience. They also, uh, as part of their fund, they kicked in $30,000 uh, 30, to, to the company. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to make want to clarify like who your who the patients will be because um, I guess there's some people who've, who've had like massive blowouts in their knee and they're the ones who are going to benefit. But also like I've got a bunch of floaties in my knee, so I've been through some STEM with my uh, chiropractor, physical therapist, massage therapist, another chiropractor, and so I just want to make sure. I mean, it's not anything too major, but um, would, would I would I benefit um, from from having something like this where it's something relatively minor? Um, is, it, is that that's that's fair. the the great the greatest benefit are going to be by, by those who have significant muscle atrophy or inhibition. Uh, those people generally know when when that's going on. Like you know, one side of, you know one side of the thigh is just completely wasted uh, by compared. By comparison. Now that said, um, loose, loose bodies. I don't know specifically what uh, what the right way is for, for handling that. I'm not going. I'm not going to speak to that. I would rather point to Rocky on that one. But uh, for any other any other knee condition for which quadriceps strengthening would be a part of rehabilitation, this is something that we think would be able to uh, support that process um, and specifically be able to take. Um, not just you know, not just getting into your physical therapy, but being able to get more of that strengthening process, uh, ideally more of that support as you're as you're walking and just and just operating. We can we can talk more afterwards and we can try to figure out something about whether or not this would be a fit because that's something I need to figure out. Hi, I'm Ross. Good job. Thank you. In the next 12 to 18 months, what is going to be the biggest hurdle to get over? And how are you getting over it? Honestly, the, the regulatory part we've got to handle on, I'd say that the two biggest hurdles that we're working on right now are proving reimbursement, uh, proving that this can be applicable, this device is applicable to the codes that are out there, and building out our, our team and advisory board. Um, I didn't, again, another thing that I didn't get to, we've got two full-time employees right now. Um, we've got to grow that out significantly. We need more core competency in the medical side on um, sales and marketing, distribution, uh, things like that. And in terms of advisors, we need to bring in more physicians who are key opinion leaders uh, in, physical in physical therapy, rheumatology, so on and so forth. Uh, that's something that Health Wildcatters is helping with. That's something, again, I'm, I'm hoping that the crowd can help with. That if you know uh, experts in the area who are, who are willing to, uh, to be a part of this, if they see value, that we want to talk about. Oh. <laughs> we start with advice and, and hopefully that will follow. Hi, my name is Puya. I have uh, no background in health, so the question might be really silly. But uh, is there any reason why this device cannot be used for people who just want to, you know, athletes who wants to improve their, you know, muscles and you're going to become better athletes? or? Is there uh, just have to be done for people who have a problem? Is there a market for that? We do think there's a market for that. Um, that the, the uh, for knee osteoarthritis, there's there's greater potential for prescription and reimbursement for this device. Outside of that, it's it's appearing more dicey. So in that situation, that's something where we either have this available uh, as a self-pay prescription device where you. Ask an orthopedic surgeon for it, and <coughs> lack of a better term, wink, they wink and nod and say, "Yeah, you, you really need this." Or the more likely and the more comfortable uh, to me the uh, option would be developing a over-the-counter version of this device, uh, and then having that be something that would be available on Amazon or off the shelf at Target. We haven't pursued that to start because first we want to get physician buy-in. We, we want the credibility of the type of device that would require a prescription. 
Um, and also our core, whatever core competencies we have, don't get lined up with any type of retail device, so uh, or any type of retail sales. That's the type of thing we would need to hire for it to really understand that market a whole lot better before we pursue it. It's time for one final question. So I'll, I'll ask, um, so as a veteran with three and a half inches of atrophy, advanced osteo, hip and knee, how do you reach people like me? Oh. I'm hoping to be able to do that sooner rather than later. We had the opportunity to pitch uh, Department of Defense Tech Scouts up at uh, Wichita State University. Uh, we were identified by uh, the Tech Scout with uh, US CENTCOM. The, uh, that's the, the, uh, the entity of DOD that's concerned with uh, middle, uh, uh, affairs in the Middle East. Uh, they ident identified our technology as a priority. I'm hoping that the, their introductions into the VA, into the uh, Surgeon General's office will give us a way to reach out to veterans that we see have a disproportionate uh, amount of uh, joint injury and degeneration that they are, uh, and I'm, I can't remember the numbers now, I apologize, but it's, it's significant in terms of just how much wear and tear happens in the course of a tour of duty, walking or running around with rucksack and, and boots. So. I'm trying to figure that out. I don't have a good answer for you, but I, I'm hoping that we're on the right path with the people that we're talking to right now. Awesome, awesome. Great presentation. Thank you. Hey, thanks again, Josh. That was a great presentation. And thank you to our sponsors. Um, I wanna, Give Reap Marketing a second to give a shout out. They are the ones part of writing coffee this morning. So here's McKinsey with Reap Marketing. Good morning. Uh, I'm glad to see so many young new faces today. I am McKinsey Turner with Reap Marketing. I work with Bryce McBeth, who is the founder of Reap Marketing and a triple entrepreneur. And he has been in your shoes as a startup or a small business. And it's difficult, even though he uh, has an agency, it's hard as a startup or um, a small business owner to be the CEO and the COO and the CFO and the CMO and the CR, you pick a CO, but there's a lot of hats you have to wear. And marketing is a, uh, it's like chasing shiny objects often. And it's hard to stay focused and figure out which ones are best and where you need to, um, uh, pick or how long you should stay there what you should do and so we have designed a beta program and that is the reason we're sponsoring coffee it's to offer it to anyone here uh, one million cups this is our last coffee by the way of the month so it's my last offer for free uh, we will be sending strategic uh, individualized emails uh, to you that are specific about your business and how to keep you on track and focus in your marketing efforts and so if you are interested in that uh, come find me afterwards and, and I'll, I'll tell you more about it, all right? Thank you. And thank you so much to Michael K. Werner Photography for sponsoring our video. He's also one of the volunteer coordinators here at uh, One Million Cups, and he's a phenomenal at videography. If your company needs any video work done, he's definitely a good guy to talk to. And thank you so much for Kurt Two Treats for bringing the delicious treats every Wednesday morning when he's able to make it. And also, thank you so much to the deck. Uh, we wouldn't be here without y'all in your lovely space. And if you're interested in learning more about the deck or having a tour, you can find Rachel in the back, currently waving her hands around wildly. And thank you so much to our sponsors. I think I'd give them a round of applause. They're really awesome and we appreciate their support. industry, I know how important it is to feel confident in all of your ideas. And one of those ways that I like to show my confidence is through the jewelry I wear. Two years ago, I was looking for professional modern jewelry that I could wear, and I wasn't finding anything I was looking for. So I decided to start uh, doing some rapid prototyping of uh, my products in architecture school. 
And as I started wearing my products, people were taking interest in the things that I was making, and so I started to sell. And that's how I started Lena Vera. Lena Vera is the modern jewelry brand for the modern woman. We make everything through digital uh, fabrication, and it is our mission to empower women, not only here in the United States, but also in third world countries. So we donate a portion of all of our profits to women in Nepal who need better access to education and to safety. So when I started uh, Lena Vera, I noticed that there is a huge problem in the jewelry market that is a big advantage for us. So the jewelry market can be broken down into three categories, costume, mid-range, and luxury jewelry. There are several options in costume jewelry, as well as in the luxury jewelry market. But within the mid-range jewelry, there really aren't many options. And as I discovered through my search for products, there is a gap because there's no moderately priced jewelry brands for the modern professional woman. And that's where I think Lena Vera comes in and can take hold of that gap. <coughs> Our products are all architecturally inspired since I have a background in architecture. And everything is very modern and clean and simple. Everything is minimal because we want uh, women to be able to go from a meeting to a party to travel and be able to wear it um, through all of those events. We use high quality products such as gold filled and sterling symbol metals. And we also have um, acrylics that won't chip, break, uh, tarnish, etc. And so everything will last a very long time. We also have a unique process by digitally modeling everything in Rhino software and then using laser cutting to both prototype and make all of our products. <laughs> Uh, branding was very important for us from the beginning. We wanted to really think of how we can have a logo, pattern, packaging, and detailing that would represent the products themselves, so that way they would become recognizable throughout um, anywhere in the public that you'd see. We also have a very unique material using just a single piece of laser cut acrylic. I was actually contacted by the Dallas Market Center um, a few months ago, and they said they had, haven't seen anything like what I've been doing because of the material and shapes, and they invite me to come show at the market, which I will be at in two months. We also have uh, really great margins. Everything's between 250 to 400 percent for all of our products, and this is because we have very low cost for the products. It's all just laser cut from one piece of acrylic, and there's no overhead because I have knowledge and resources in all the design, <coughs> web design, photography, etc. Um, and again, our mission is to empower women and to raise awareness for the mistreatment of women in third world countries and to donate um, a portion of our sales to those women. So the process started um, about a year and a half ago and all I had was four designs made of some leftover wood I had from architecture school. And now we have 50 designs and everything is high quality and we outsource a lot of the products. And so for the competition, I wanted to focus on the mid-range jewelry category, but more specifically on the range for 21 to 35 year old females. So the first um, uh, competitor is Kendra Scott. She has a huge um, hold on that uh, market, and they have a really strong brand and high quality. However, they don't have like, a lot of modern options, and it's seen more as a trendy um, product and less as like a simple, modern, professional product. And they're often on the higher end of the cost. Then you have Etsy, where you can get affordable, modern design. However, the quality is often much lower, and um, you have to sift through a lot of some goofy products just to find some of the few modern pieces. And then you have boutiques, which are very affordable, which have affordable products. However, it's very hard to go find modern pieces and to find good quality. And they often are reselling the products, so they aren't innovating new things because they're just reselling for wholesale. So we believe that we have an advantage over all of our competition because we really have strong modern designs, we have high quality products, we have a strong brand and we have um, good margins and affordable prices. We also believe we have um, opportunity in the market because there's huge growth in the jewelry market and the branded jewelry will quadruple by 2020 in the market. So we believe that we'll have um, an advantage there. And we also, um, when we follow the market trends, we're hitting the majority of those, such as bold designs, um, emphasis on style, being socially responsible, having mid-range affordability, and having strong branding. Our target market is the um, young professional woman in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We believe that this is an achievable market um, to target through uh, social media and through boutiques here. And we believe that once we're able to grasp a good uh, brand strategy here, that we can start expanding to new markets. And so for channels of distribution, we go through e-commerce, trade shows, and boutiques. And um, that's the front of our website. And then, um, one example for a growth strategy is the trade shows. I'll actually be appearing at my first trade show uh, this weekend. 
As far as our goals for the short term, again, it's to gain brand recognition in the Dallas Fort Worth area and to get into boutiques here and to also gain a bigger social media following. I believe that when you see a product in person once and online once, you start to really recognize that brand everywhere you go. So it's our goal to get into as many uh, small shops here and online into influencers' hands and to eventually expand into the Boston market and hopefully into uh, New York and LA. And I'd like to, um, in long term, get into big box stores and expand into new markets. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, very first question is, what can we do for you as a community? So the one thing I've been um, struggling with a little bit is the marketing. I have a lot of background in um, design and creating the products and a lot of interest in business, but it's the marketing that I'm struggling with a bit. So if anyone has any tips or anything with that or knows um, influencers in the area that could help promote through social media or knows anyone that owns boutiques, I mean, just connections are the things that I use needing the most help with. Questions? Uh, great job. Uh, good morning. Um, so, how do you convey to the, the customer the, the uh, charitable <coughs> side of it? Uh, it when when, when there, there's a shoe company out there that donates shoes to kids in third world countries every time you you buy a pair of shoes. There's, there are a number of other businesses that are out there doing something very similar, but they all seem very, it's, it sort of flows logically and they're able to convey it to their, their end customer. Um, yours, the, it just seemed a little, it seems a little random. Um, and, and so I, I understand what you're trying to do and I, 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 I get that, but how do you convey that to your customer so that it then turns into sales, because they're gonna to wanna to support whatever you're trying to support as well, but it doesn't seem to, to flow logically to me, and okay. so it kind of confuses me. I'm also very right. simple, and I'll, I'm also a man, so I'm not your, your customer, but so. <laughs> so that, that is one thing that um, I've been playing around with, like how far to push that. Um, Kendra Scott is a company that has that as a component of their products and their brand, but that's not necessarily the main point of their company. And I went and visited some trade shows where there was a, um, a company that their whole brand was around, it was called like Fashion That Feeds. And I felt like it detracted from their image. Not that it's not a good image, but I felt like the design was lacking because it was more kitschy with, oh, bite the bullet. And so all of the things were like bullet shells. And I felt like it was so kitschy that it wasn't promoting the solid design. And that is something I'm trying to integrate more and find a way to make it a part of the brand, but not to keep, have it detract from the simplicity of the products and from the idea that it's first and foremost like a fashion brand. Uh, but I, again, I'm happy to take suggestions of that because that's again something I've been um, playing around with how much or how little to express that. Uh, what does your profit margin look like? Uh, on, on your stuff? Um, so everything is between about a 250 and 400% margin. Um, the biggest cost is the metal itself. So the pendants only cost me about five cents to make each. They're very inexpensive. It's the chain that will add about, for a small necklace, like $10 to that cost because, I mean, it's just when you want the nicer quality products that you don't want to fade, it's gonna cost more. However, I mean, the fact that we can, I can make a product for about $10 and sell it for 45 and people still buy it is, Good, so. <laughs> it's a two-pronged uh, question. Sure. One is, what is your your uh, marketing strategy to get into boutiques? Mm -hmm. And then, are you also, since you're part of your uh, vision of the company is to embolden women, and are you have you cross-referenced into other to get to those type of women that are already professionals, young women, like? For instance, STEM program. STEM program is an outreach program for uh, for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. They go after one of the, the demographics they go after is women. So, have you cross-referenced those type of programs that you may want to be a part of that you can engage with those type of professional women that are in your demographics for who you're going after? 
Sure. So to be honest, I just graduated from undergrad like a few months ago. So this is all very new and I haven't had too much time to do some of this stuff. But um, my next step is to try to um, start. Well, first of all, for getting the stores, um, cold calling, just I make packets and I go talk to the boutiques and keep reaching out, keep bothering them, see if they'll um, take my products. And so it's basically just kind of that door to door grind. Um, as far as reaching out to professional women and STEM, um, that is one of my strategies. It's just something that I haven't ex had, I haven't put the time into yet to start focusing on more of the marketing strategy and reaching out to those people. Um, I'm trying to compile a list of programs and people to reach out to, and so I think that's a really great one. So I appreciate that um, that idea. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> sorry. About that. Um, so I know that you didn't have a lot, a lot of time to properly express the differentiation. I still don't necessarily understand how it truly differentiates itself from Ken Scott. Okay. I just worry there might be a hard time truly selling that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you you can you know add to that? Uh, yeah. So I guess um, the first. Uh, answer I have that is to, I personally didn't want Kendra Scott stuff and so I made something that was a more modern, yeah. minimal, sleek alternative to that. Because to me when I go into those stores it feels much girlier, much trendier, more for the kind of like ignorant bliss sort of uh, brand and I want to create something that's a little bit more modern, sleek. Um, and so I don't feel like it's really, the designs are different in that sense and so I believe that it's Mine are going to be targeting more of a professional, um, maybe a little more modern uh, woman that's less trendy, maybe a little bit more like street style, like New York. Because Kendra Scott is incredibly southern, and you don't see anywhere in the Northeast. And so I think that um, I know I'm here in Dallas, I'm trying to spread it, but I think that it might have success more in the Northeast, where that's more of the trend of what women are wearing. Uh. Great presentation. Um, would, would you like an introduction to Kendra Scott? Because I've met her a few times. I'm from Austin. And, uh, she made Are you great serious? Yeah. yeah, let's talk after. Okay. <laughs> okay. I almost forgot my question. Um, I'm Sana Hussein. Great job presenting. Thank you. Um, so you have 50 designs right now. Yes. Uh, do you go about surveying your target market before you produce a concept? Um, and what has the response been on certain pieces? Thank you. So when I started, I had about 12, well, I had about 12 prototypes and I asked a lot of my friends that are all designers and people that I would assume are like my target market to kind of give me critiques on it. And so I adjusted and took out some and started adding things. And I went and searched at like, you know, I just go to every jewelry store and just looked at what's the trend, trying to study that. And so trying to figure out how I can apply those trends and, you know, proper proportions and everything to my products. That's still something I'm testing again. Um, this has been, I mean, I'm just barely getting out of the, kind of the uh, foundation of getting everything ready. And I'm having my first show this weekend. So that'll be a good way to test out and put the products in front of people and see what's doing well what's not, but I've been trying to do some research and ask um, on the side um, throughout everything, but did, I, did that answer your question? But, <laughs> oh, one other question, but do you think 50 designs is a lot of designs for like, maybe too much for a beginning company? So um, that's, it ranges from there's um, earrings and necklaces and that's including, it's basically more like 50 SKU numbers because that's including the, um, the different colors. So it's, it's probably less than 50, but I mean, that's like the, the number of options to get. And that ranges from necklaces, earrings, bracelets, rings, and stuff. So it feels like there's less, uh, but I wanted to have enough variety so that way I could um, have, you know, have some smaller ones, some large ones, just for different people that would be looking for. Because not everyone's a big necklace person, not everyone's a tiny necklace person, so. Thank you. Well, I love it. I think you did great. I'm clearly your market. Uh, so my question is, uh, how much can you produce? 
because I have a feeling if you show up at Dallas Market Center and even your other show coming up, mm -hmm. that um, you could be rapidly out of product quickly and have nothing to sell. Um, that is definitely correct. Yes. Um, I have been, you know, I, I work full time, so I go work, I come home, I'm home by like seven, and I just sit there and make stuff all night and hope that it'll be enough. Um, if, so you're it? Uh, it's just me. I'm the only one that's doing any of this. It's been, I've done all the like, Design, prototyping, web design, photography, editing, all of it. So, yeah. So, so that's why it's been a little bit of like a slower process, just since I haven't had too much help in dealing with graduation and starting a full-time job. Um, but that is something that if I go to the trade show and I get a huge order, I mean, I'm gonna have to start hiring people to help me make it and start looking into options on how to. Because I can get the products to be, or the pieces, um, manufactured, but I have to, you know, hand put it together. So that would be the next step is figuring out how to uh, do that more quickly. So that's a good point that scares me. <laughs> so. Okay. Hi. My name's Reed, and I was just wondering why exactly you chose Nepal. Nepal? So um, I've been really interested in, um, you know, issues where... Uh, women in third world countries and Nepal is one of the worst countries for women and I did a lot of research in Nepal and saw that I mean women are forced into very um, dangerous child marriages I mean there's 13 year old girls that are forced into marriage with like 50 year old guys and it's just really unsafe and they don't get opportunities to get an education and get out of that and Nepal is absolutely one of the worst places for that I don't think there's a lot of education with that and so I wanted to help spread awareness with that. And there's also an organization called um, Children Not Brides that tries to help um, women. So I partnered with a group that sends bikes to Nepal to help women gain access to school because a lot of women are scared to go to school because they get assaulted on their way there. But if they have a bike, they can get to school, get out of child marriage, get there safely. And so I just thought that was a really cool opportunity to get involved with that. And um, I just think that helps just to have something that's not just about making money or jewelry, but about helping people. And we actually did um, send a bike to a girl in Nepal, so it's a small thing, but we were able to like change at least one life through that. So that's why I wanted it. Can we have time for one final question? Hi, this is Booyah. Uh, great job. Uh, Thank you. Just more of a com commentary. I mean, the, the social causes is, is very, uh, very good to have. I've worked internationally many years, but I found out that people always, the social causes that are local is uh, much more impactful. Okay. So uh, if your target is Dallas, you know, why not focus on the, the women, underprivileged women in, in Dallas? And in Dallas, what would they uh, grow at? Like that local, that's my... Uh, um, I think that's a good point. Um, I don't necessarily have an answer for that. I think I've just been very passionate. I mean, the idea that women are put in a, you know, a dark cave for a month um, because they're deemed like dirty during their time of the month, I think is pretty sad. And that's not really happening necessarily here. And I think that that's something I just am so horrified by and want to help in another country. And I think that with my products, I'm hoping to be a platform for women to feel more confident in, when they're in male dominant industries like law, medicine, architecture, engineering, to have that voice and confidence. Um, and so that's what I feel like I'm trying to do here more and um, also help the really extreme conditions of third world countries. And not to deny that there's not issues going here, but I mean, I cannot solve every problem for women, so I'm trying to target the few that matter to me. And so I, I mean, as I grow, I'd like to help as many women as possible, but that's just, it's really not my, it's, I can't do all of it. Uh, have, have you thought since, since your profit margin is around uh, right here, three or four hundred percent, have you thought about uh, finding uh, maybe women to uh, help you sell it, uh, like maybe giving them a discount uh, and, and allowing them to, to resell your stuff? Um, I haven't necessarily thought of that. That feels a little multi-level marketing, I guess. But um, I haven't. I've, I've been trying to get some social media influencers to try promoting my product and to give them a code so that like, people get a portion of their uh, of the sales. However, most of them want like $500 just to post one post on Instagram. And for me right now, that's just not a viable option. Um, 
being a new grad and not having much money. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to find some creative, inexpensive ways to do that. So I think that's a good idea um, to reach out and find some people that are would be able to sell and make um, some money. And that's why I think having the big margins, there's some opportunity with that. But I'm just trying to explore and see kind of, just because I haven't, I mean, this weekend will be the first time that I'm really getting the product out there. And although the site's been live, it's been more like I'd say beta mode just because it's, it's been available, but I haven't really been doing any marketing or pushing, so that's where um, I wanted to come here, talk about it, get some feedback, go to these shows this weekend, and kind of start. But I think that's a good idea to get some people to sell, because definitely can't do it all. Oh my God. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, guys. so much that was a great presentation and thanks you guys those were all really awesome questions for both presenters so I'm sure they appreciate the feedback um, yeah so that's it for one million cups thank you so much for coming out our presenters will be in the front if you want to have a chat with them afterwards otherwise thanks and have a great Wednesday